This is a high quality professional stream. You would think by the high quality that, um, you know, you are all paying me to be here. But uh, that, that's not the case. <laughs> oh, let's enjoy our week. Let's enjoy our week. Oh, my goodness. Lots of stuff's going on in this crazy world. Election season soon. The Grand Polk heads up match soon. Trying to win money at poker soon. All sorts of stuff. I have a few secret projects coming up too that um can't tell all of you about, but they'll happen. Taking up a lot of my time, but that's okay. Tournament Masterclass coming soon. That'll be at the end of November. Make sure you are a Poker Coaching Premium member. You will have full access to that as soon as we get it uploaded. If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member already. We have a Cash Game Masterclass. That's just included. Make sure you check that out in the Courses section. Excited to be part of the Office Hours. Well, we're excited to have you. I'm going to be having Office Hours for the Poker Coaching Premium member starting next week. So that'll be, that'll be uh, coming up soon. Lots of stuff happening soon. I've been reviewing a lot of hand histories. That's something I gotta do today. Let me write, write a note. Review more hand histories. For the Poker Coaching Premium Members, is, again, make sure if you're a me, uh, Premium Member to submit your hands. I'm happy to review them. <sighs> today we're gonna be discussing factors to consider when you get three bet. Getting three bets tough, it's never fun. Turns out, one of the most difficult spots you can be in, in poker, is when you're facing aggression, whether it be a raise, a three bet, a four bet, a five bet, whatever. Anytime your opponent re-raises you, it puts you in a bad spot because you then have to figure out how to proceed with a likely somewhat marginal range. Uh-oh, look at this. My restream program's not functioning properly. Let's see. Hmm, wonder why that happened. Let's see if this works. Eh, close enough. Sure, that'll work. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. The guys in the poker coaching study group are taking all the money. You had a 22K score and an 11K score yesterday. Nice job, good work. You can get in that study stream, by the way. Send um, the poker coaching Discord. I believe it starts at 10 a.m. You could not find my Facebook feed. Okay. Not sure what's going on with Facebook. If anybody's here on Facebook watching right now, let me know. Oh yeah, people are here on Facebook. Okay, so I don't know. Are there study groups? There are study groups. If you're a Poker Coaching member, get in the Discord. Go to PokerCoaching.com. Go to the uh, community section and you will find the study group there. It's ran by Louis Philippe right here. Louis Philippe, maybe you can give a little bit of info. That'll, that'll be very helpful. All right, so today we're going to discuss factors to consider when you get three bet. Okay? This is when you raise and someone re-raises you. Just to be clear, three bet means the third bet. It's a, terminolo a term some people misunderstand to mean raise to three big blinds or something like that. But it's a three bet. The big blind is the initial bet. The initial preflop raise is the second bet. And the re-raise is the third bet. So if you're playing one, two, no limit, somebody makes it $6, you make it $18. That is the third bet, okay? If someone limps and someone raises, that's the second bet because the initial limper's just calling the big blind, right? So if someone limps and someone raises, that's not a three bet, that's just a raise. People um, misunderstood, understand the term three bet post-flop. That's not what we're talking about today, but the first bet on the flop is the one bet. The raise is the two bet. The re-raise is the three bet. Anytime you are re-raising, the first re-raise is the three bet. Then four bet, five bet, etc. Okay. First things first. When we get three bet, we raise our hand, our opponent re-raises us. What should we be considering? There's a bunch of factors, but first and foremost, what is the opponent's strategy? Very, very important. Very, very important, right? Because if your opponent's really, really tight, you should proceed very tightly. If your opponent's very, very loose, you should proceed very loosely. For example, if you raise and you know your opponent announces they're gonna re-raise 100% of hands, 
Well, now you should proceed with a quite wide strategy, right? Alternatively, say you're playing relatively shallow stacked. Someone, or you raise, someone re-raises, and they announce they have aces. Somehow they turn them up or something. Well, you should probably be folding unless you're getting the correct implied odds, which is another thing we'll be discussing in just a second. Okay, so what is the opponent's strategy? Are they essentially how wide are they three betting and what range are they three betting with? Because people three bet with different ranges, which is highly important. Some people will three bet with a linear range, which is just all the best hands, like aces, kings, queens, jacks, tens, nines, ace, king, ace, queen. Whereas other people will three bet with a much wider range, and including um, a lots of bluffs. Some people three bet only the best hands and then a lot of bluffs. That's a polarized strategy, and often is that is a good strategy you should use, especially when you are going to be in position. So if you raise and someone three bets you with a polarized strategy, and you have a hand like king queen, you can't really fold. But if you know someone's three betting with only the best hands, you should definitely fold, right? Because king queen is going to be dominated by the very best hands, but it's going to fare fine enough if your opponent's three betting king jack offsuit and uh, you know king eight suited, right? So you want to consider your opponent's strategy and then how your particular hand lines up against that strategy. Like I just gave an example with the king-queen, right? You raise king-queen, if a very tight player three bets you, you are dominated to death, right? Your opponent's going to have aces, kings, queens, jacks. You're dominated by almost all of them. And then they're going to have ace, king, and ace, queen, and you're dominated by all of them. So against that player, king-queen should be folded. But if your opponent's going to three bet that range plus a bunch of low junky bluffs, king-queen's actually okay then right? So that is very, very relevant. You also want to consider how you want to play your entire range, because you may find that sometimes you have to make concessions with specific hands that may be profitable as a call, but you have to use them as a re-raise instead. Um, that's a bit of a more advanced topic that I can't just explain using simple, simple words in two seconds, but um, trust me, you need to consider your whole range and how you want to continue. A an example of this is say you raise under the gun, with a pretty tight range, right? Like maybe king jack offsuit's the worst hand in your range. If you raise this and someone three bets you, it's fine to fold out the worst hands in your range, right? But if you raise the button and then the big blind three bets you, or you raise the button and the cutoff three bets you, king jack offsuit's usually going to be a little bit too good to fold because king jack offsuit is much higher up in your initial opening range from the cutoff or the button than it is when you're under the gun, right? So in one scenario, king jack is essentially the bottom of your range. In another scenario, king jack is you know in the meet, in the middle of your range, right? So that is important to note that specific hands will fall in different portions of your range at different times. All right, did I watch Joe Rogan? No, I do not watch Joe Rogan. When is the Negranu Polk match? I believe it starts November first, but um, I'm not entirely sure. How's it been going? Life's been going well. All right, let's see. Next, pot odds. What are the pot odds we are getting immediately? Because that's going to be a very, very important factor. Let's say you raise to three big blinds and then someone re-raises to seven. Well, now you have to put in four big blinds to win a pot that's going to be your opponent seven, your seven, small blind, big blind, ante if you're playing with an ante. 7, 8, 9, well, so 14, 15, 16 and a half. You have to put in 4 to win 16 and a half big blinds. Do you think you're going to realize 25% equity? If you open with something reasonable, you probably will, unless your opponent has exactly aces. And to be fair, when people do re-raise small, they very often do give you good odds, but they usually have a very, very good hand. They're essentially saying, I'm going to give you 3 to 1 pot odds, and you still can't beat me. If they're going to give you three to one pot odds and you still can't beat them, what must that mean? That means they must have a very, very good hand, right? So if that's the case, then you should get out of the way, especially with hands that tend to be dominated. That said, if you're getting really good imply, uh, get really good pot odds, you should stick around with a lot of hands. Like any suited hand, you kind of have to call. Um, any like good big cards, you kind of have to call. You should shy away from the like ace five offsuit type hands. Like, say you raise the cutoff and the button three bets you small, it's fine to fold stuff like ace five offsuit. Maybe even like ace nine offsuit is okay to fold. But if it was suited, you definitely would not fold because you're getting the adequate pot odds then to draw. If you you raise and your opponent three bets huge, let's say you raise to two big blinds under the gun and then the cutoff three bets to 15 big blinds. You'll often see this in small stakes cash games. I actually discussed this. It's over there. In the uh, cash game masterclass, 
at pokercoaching.com. Make sure you check that out. Um, how do you deal against people who use giant raise sizes? The answer is you fold a lot. Unless, of course, they're bluffing a lot. But if they're playing normally, you just fold a lot and move on. And it's okay. It's okay to fold a lot if your opponent uses giant sizes. Because they're risking a lot to win very little. So you should play pretty tightly when you face big re-raises. Um, so pot odds are relevant. Also, implied odds slash reverse implied odds are relevant. These all kind of go hand in hand. And implied odds and reverse implied odds imply that stack depth is very relevant. You should be way more inclined to call with just good, strong, high card hands when you're shallow stacked compared to when you're deeper stacked. And that's because, say you have ace-jack offsuit and you are 15 big blinds deep, if you raise and someone just goes all in, it's probably fine to call because, you know, ace-jack's pretty good, you're in fine shape against a wide shoving range, and you're good to go. However, if you're deeper stacked, even getting better immediate pot odds, you are going to be getting very, very bad impl uh, reverse implied odds, meaning if you do make top pair, like if an ace comes or a jack comes when you have ace-jack, and your opponent still wants to put in like 200 big blinds, how do you think that ace-jack is faring, right? And it turns out hands like ace-jack offsuit and king-jack offsuit very often make top pair bad kicker. Well, bad relative to your opponent's three-bet value range, right? So if you're against ace-king, ace-queen, ace-jack, and you have king-jack, you're in pretty bad shape when you make that top pair, right? So reverse implied odds are very relevant. Um, implied odds are also relevant, though. A lot of people think that you need to be getting great implied odds with hands like suited connectors and small pairs. But in reality, you're not necessarily calling with these hands when you get three bet only to make a set. For example, if you raise with, let's say, pocket sevens and someone three bets you, you don't love the scenario, but you should still continue the vast majority of the time. And that's because sevens is going to win on its own merit, just with one pair some chunk of the time after the flop. And you have to be willing to stick around a little bit. You have to be a little bit um, call happy after the flop, especially when you're getting very, very good odds. Okay? So let's say you do raise sevens to two and a half big blinds and the button three bets you to seven and a half big blinds and you're playing 50 big blinds. Let's say you're playing 35 big blinds deep. This is a spot where folding is really not an option unless you go back to the first point we talked about today your opponent's strategy if your opponent is really 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 tight and you know they have a really really good hand then i guess you can fold but in a normal scenario this is actually a spot to either call looking to try to not fold this hand by the river unless the board comes out a bunch of high cards or you want to raise all in re-raise all in because you expect your opponent to be bluffing uh, enough to give you fold equity, which is a, another point we're going to talk about in just a second. But essentially, stack depth is very important. You're going to find that specific hands play better at specific stack depths. As you get deeper and deeper and deeper stacked, you should be calling way more often with the small pairs, medium pairs, um, marginal suited hands like 9-7 suited, ace-5 suited, etc. And as you're deeper stacked, I'm sorry, as you're shallower stacked, you should be more inclined to not fold the big cards like king-queen offsuit, ace-jack offsuit, etc. Okay? So stack depth is going to change the, um, the hands you continue with as well. Let's take a break, see what all of you are talking about. You're in the money lately, but not able to make the final table. Well, sorry? <laughs> I mean, what do you want me to say to this? You're probably playing too tightly or too maniacally. A lot of people, it's not so hard to get in the money in a tournament. If your goal is to get in the money, you can probably get in the money 30% of the time or more. But that's a losing strategy because you will sneak into the money with a short stack and then rarely win the tournament. The goal should be to get in the money with lots of chips, and then sometimes you're going to win, sometimes you're not. Last three weeks in a row online, in a $1,000 buy-in tournament, one of the bigger tournaments I'm playing on the day, I've gotten in the money with close to the chip lead. And then it just doesn't go well. I think I took uh, like a 12th place two weeks ago, a 9th place last week, and this week I took like 16th. And they just lost some hands going late in the tournament. You have to realize whenever you have the chip lead, usually you have like three times average, right? And it turns out three times average just means you get to lose three big hands in a row. And if you get it all in with ace-king three times in a row and you lose them all, sorry, you're out of the tournament. Any advice from Poker Coaching Premium? Use the search feature. Look up deep uh, strategy for when you're making deep runs, et cetera, et cetera. You got my latest book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em. I'm glad you all enjoyed it. If you all like my books, by the way, I would appreciate it if you spend a few minutes leaving a review on Amazon, Goodreads, wherever you bought it. I would appreciate that. That goes a long way to helping other people know that 
my books are useful. So I would definitely appreciate that. All right. Let's see. Okay, so we know we need to factor in our opponent's strategy, our cards, how our cards fare against our opponent's strategy, how our range fares against our opponent's strategy, the pot odds, the implied odds slash reverse implied odds. Next, fold equity. Okay? Fold equity is the idea that if you re-raise, your opponent's going to fold some portion of the time, assuming, assuming they're not only re-raising with the absolute best hands. Right? So if they're re-raising without only the absolute best hands, that means that they're going to fold some of those hands. Okay. So now, the question is, do you have a little bit of fold equity or a lot of fold equity? And if you have a little bit of fold equity, you don't really want to be four betting all that often. But if you have a lot of fold equity because your opponent's three betting with a very wide strategy, well, now you should in turn four bet quite wide. There was a period in online poker where people were three betting a ton. So what do you do? Well, the correct answer is four bet a ton. Um, I remember this was it, was, it was a while ago. Um, where, like, literally every time I opened late position, someone would three-bet me, and I would four-bet all in every single time for, like, 40 big blinds or less. And they folded so often. And the thing is, is that whenever they do fold, you pick up your initial raise, because otherwise you would have folded and lost it. Um, you pick up their three-bet. So if you make it two big blinds, they make it 5.5 big blinds, etc. Then, um... And then when you jam, you pick up their 5.5, your 2, small blind, big blind, ante. So that is uh, 5.5, 6.7, 5, 5, 8, 9, 10. You pick up 10 big blinds whenever they fold. And if they're folding half of the time or a third of the time or something like that, you're just picking up a huge amount of chips whenever they fold. And whenever they call, you still win some portion of the time. I think that's what a lot of people don't quite fully recognize is they think that if they get it all in and they get called, they assume they just lose every single time. But you don't lose every single time, you only lose sometimes. Some of you are asking to give a link to the most recent book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. I just posted the Amazon link right there. Looks like it went out to Twitter and YouTube. Something's going on with this program. It looks like Periscope's not working at all. Connection in state of error, all right. Facebook looks like it's having problems too. Internal error, whatever. It's on Twitter and, uh, I'm sorry, it's on Twitch and YouTube. There's that link. Or you're going to search, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. Thank you for leaving the review or getting the book. I appreciate it. Are you calling a three bet with small pairs when the effective stack size is 35 big blinds or lower? Not necessarily. Depends on the scenario, right? Uh, typically, the small pairs, the, the worst pairs when you're shallow stacked are usually going to do best by um, shoving all in or folding. Very often, folding is going to be the right play when you're really shallow. Um, and the times you should shove, it's when your opponents are very, very loose. I'm your favorite poker author. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Let's see. Will it be on Audible? It will be on Audible soon. I actually recorded it over the last two weeks. Went pretty quick, actually. Only took um, 30, 32 hours to record, so that's good. Sat in a little box, half the size of my normal small office, and read the book for um, 32 hours straight. Did I ever study on various other poker sites? Yes. Some of them are good or some of them are bad. I typically don't say the names of the ones that are not so good. So uh, there you go. Don't want to send all of you to, bad, to content that I don't recommend. All right. Let's see. Next, post-flop equity realization. As your hand is going to play better after the flop, you should be way, 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 way more inclined to call with your hand. Good example of this. A lot of people presume that you need to be getting great implied odds to call with hands like suited connectors. But realize that if you get middle pair, something like that, you're usually happy enough to get it all in after the flop if you're shallow stacked. So let's say you do raise 10-9 suited, someone three bets, and you're playing 25 big blinds deep. So let's say you made it two, they made it five. You have to put in three to try to win a total of... Well, do the math, right? You're five, your opponent's five, small blind, big blind, ante. So three to win 12.5. Are you going to realize 12.5% equity after the flop? I'm sorry, 25% equity after the flop. What am I saying? You're going to realize 25% equity after the flop. Three divided by 12.5 is, uh, call it 25%. And the thing is that when you're shallow stacked, you can very happily call because if you make even a pair after the flop, 
you're usually pretty happy getting it all in. This is very different than the often cited number of 20 to 1 implied odds with small, uh, with suited connectors. Because these implied odds numbers that a lot of people cite, myself included sometimes, imply that you always lose no money unless you make an effective nut hand, like a straight draw, flush draw, or set two pair, etc. Well, trips two pair, etc. Um, so if you raise with a hand like 10-9 suited and your plan is to fold unless you flop a very, very strong hand, then yeah, you need to be getting really good implied odds. The thing is, though, is that you aren't trying to make only very, very, very strong hands. If your goal in poker is to raise with pocket nines, call a three bet with it, and then just check fold on 7-4-2, hate to break it to you, but you're probably going to get completely ran over. And that is not ideal, okay? You want to make sure that you are playing post-flop well, which is something we discussed thoroughly in the Cash Game Masterclass and also in lots of content at PokerCoaching.com. But you're going to find that when you're playing deeper stack, you especially need to make sure you're playing well. And um, that's, that's a problem a lot of people have. They just want to make the nuts. They want to know. They want to definitively know that they have the nuts. And I hate to break it to you, but if you're waiting for only the nuts, you are going to essentially blind out. You're going to call the three bets. You're going to like check call flop, check fold turn way too often. And that's going to result in lots and lots of small and medium pots going your opponent's direction. And if you let that happen, you're going to get crushed. I don't want you to get crushed. I want you all to win. So those are the main factors you need to consider when facing a three bet. We'll recap them. Um, your opponent's strategy. How wide are they three betting in? With what type of range are they three betting? Realize all 12% three betting strategies are not the same 12% of hands, right? You can make up that 12% of hands in various ways. You also want to be concerned with how your cards lines up with your opponent's strategy and how your range lines up with your opponent's strategy and where your hand falls in your initial range. Also, you want to be concerned with the pot odds. The better pot odds you're getting, the more often you should call, right? The worse pot odds that you're getting, the more often you should fold. Next, implied odds slash reverse implied odds. When you are getting good implied odds, you should be more inclined to call with well, sorry, when you're getting good implied odds, the hands that are getting good, that need good implied odds should be more inclined to continue. When you have a hand that is going to be getting reverse implied odds, ideally you'd rather be shallow stacked so that you don't lose a whole lot when you happen to run into better hands. Like um, the ordinary man says here, the nuts isn't always the nuts. Yeah, well, shallow stack, when you have ace jack and it comes ace three two, you're pretty happy, but you lose sometimes, right? And whenever that happens, you want to make sure the amount you are losing is not all that much, right? Um, and this, uh, so implied odds slash reverse implied odds kind of go hand in hand with stack depth because um, that's going to imply, or that's going to um, give you your implied odds slash reverse implied odds. Next, fold equity. Can you make your opponent fold if you four bet? If you can make them fold a lot of the time when you four bet, you should be four betting a lot. If you can not make them fold with a four bet, well, you should not be four betting a lot and you should be calling and or folding way more often. And finally, post-flop equity realization. How well does your hand play after the flop? And to be fair, how skilled you are at post-flop play. Okay? Those are all the factors you need to consider when facing three bets. I suppose if you're playing in tournaments, um, you should consider the idea of you should probably be a little bit tighter if your entire stack is going to be at risk. That said, I don't care about this all that often. I was actually just reviewing a hand from the World Series of Poker main event the other day. Um, I made a quiz out of it for poker coaching members where... Someone raised, I three bet ace three suited, small blind, four bet me tiny, to where I was getting three to one pot odds to call. So it must have gone like two and a half big blinds. I made it like seven big blinds. They made it something like 14 or 15 big blinds. And I had something like 60 big blinds total. It's a pretty bad spot to be in, but you know, I'm a sucker for good pot odds, right? That's a good example of a spot where my hand's not great against my opponent's range at all. I'm gonna be super dominated, but I'm in position. I am getting amazing pot odds. We're getting, we're, we're going to be able to play post slot pretty well. I get a pair I'm putting my money in, right? Even if it's only a three. And um, that was it. So I actually flopped a pair in flush draw. My opponent bet. I jammed all in. They folded. Must have had ace king, right? Or some weird bluff like king queen or who knows what they had. But um, it's a spot where I was willing to splash around even though my tournament life was likely to be at risk in this hand because I was just getting amazing pot odds and I was in position and my hand's going to play very easily after the flop. I'm not going to make a whole lot of, call it errors after the flop where I'm folding the best hand because I know I'm not folding the best hand because the pot's already huge. 
Um, I will call off with the worst hand, but the thing is when you're calling off with the worst hand, then you are getting good pot odds with like a pair, with, with a pair, right? Because you always have five outs to, to pair. So that's the spot where I was willing to put it all in in the main event of the World Series of Poker with a junky pair if that's what it came to. Um, interestingly enough, in that spot, say it comes like any board pretty much, if I get any flush draw, I'm also going to go all in. So if my opponent bets and I have any flush draw, I'm going to be jamming in that scenario. If your opponents don't fold, should you adjust your play? Of course you should. You should always adjust your strategy, take advantage of whatever your opponent's doing correctly. If your opponents aren't going to fold to a re-raise, then only re-raise for value, right? Life's easy when, you're, when you know what your opponents do wrong. The tough thing about poker is very often you don't know what your opponents do wrong. 100 big blinds deep, what is a relatively high 4-bet frequency? Definitely need to be careful relying too much given generally small sample sizes. Um, Dylan, I honestly don't even know because it depends on your opponent's strategy, right? It heavily, heavily, heavily depends on your opponent's strategy. If your opponent's 3-betting a lot, you in turn can 4-bet a lot and call a lot. If your opponent's 3-betting really tight, you in turn should be folding a lot and calling with only implied odds hands. Um, so you really should be 4-betting almost none. So I'm, I'm always very hesitant to give out like like what should what like what should stats look like because it's all over the place it's completely all over the place how much does strategy change heads up heads up you have to be way more inclined to call again but it really doesn't change a ton realize when you get three bet preflop you raised in position you got three bets so you're always going to be in position preflop and postflop and you're closing the action which is nice as well so you get to call versus three bets way more often in heads up pots than in other scenarios and also ranges are ranges are going to be wider across the board I mean, if your opponent's good, very often you raise, they're going to be three betting hands like jack five offsuit as a bluff. If they're three betting jack five offsuit as a bluff, because they're three betting a polarized strategy perhaps, then you just can't really justify folding too often. Matt Affleck is streaming tonight from 5 p.m. till 11 p.m. Don't miss it. Awesome. Glad to hear it. 58 likes. Well, everyone doesn't like discussing dealing with three bets. They already know how to play against three bets. Great. <laughs> to be fair, if you like the show, click like, click subscribe. I'd appreciate it. It's really easy to click the like button. Like, look, I've, I've made a bunch of clicks today. Just click like. Click subscribe. It's not hard. Against the Maniac that always raises and jams pretty light, or do we should we play tight or find another game? No! You should be happy to gamble. Why would you want to fold if your opponent's trying to give away their money? If your opponent's trying to give away their money, realize that their strategy is wide open, which in turn means you get to get it in wider. Like, let's say you are playing 100 big blinds deep and you raise ace-jack offsuit, and you know the guy in the cutoff always goes all in with any two cards because he's insane. If your opponent's going to go all in with any two cards because they're insane, you should be happy to call off for 100 big blinds with ace-jack offsuit. You should not fold and wait for a better spot because another better spot may not come around. If you raise with ace-jack offsuit and a lunatic rips it all in, hate to break it to you, that's the spot where you should call if you know for a fact, like you say, they always jam it all in. Now, make sure they always jam it all in and not... They make sure they don't jam it all in you know, 10% of the time. So make sure you actually fully understand your opponent's strategy. But your goal is to play pots against people who are making errors and people who are raising and re-raising and going all in very, very frequently are making consistent errors on a regular basis. And if you don't get in there and exploit what they're doing wrong, somebody else will. All right. Almost 70,000 subscribers on YouTube, Kevin says. Great. Let's get there. The goal is to get to 100,000 by the end of the year. I don't think we're going to make it. But we'll get close. If you, if somebody else has, I guess, uh, 30,000 friends, will you tell them to go please click the subscribe button on my YouTube channel? <laughs> what do you think you lack in poker if there is some, something after winning so much? What do you mean by what do I lack? You mean in terms of accolades? I never really cared about accolades. What do I lack? I lack um, perfect fundamental understanding. I lack time to sit down and grind consistently on a regular basis. Um, lack amazing post-flop reads. I, li I lack a lot as a poker player. Most people lack a lot as a poker player. In terms of accolades, I, like I said, I don't really care about accolades. They just don't matter all that much. Um, anyway, I don't know. I, I, I tend, I, I don't, I clarify the question. Everyone could always be better at something in poker, and that is why I surround myself with many of the absolute best players in the world. We mentioned in my book earlier, it's selling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games. Let me show you. Notice here. This is a collaborative effort. I worked with many of the absolute best online players in the world to make this book for you. Here we have Ape Styles, John Van Fleet. Literally, he might be the biggest winner in online tournaments. We have Giraffe Ganger, 
He was the number one online player in the year, uh, number one online player for quite a while um, recently. We have uh, Vlada Stojanovic. Can you see this? Vlada is the man. Vlada um, won the Poker Stars uh, Stadium Series for a million and a half bucks, right? Anyway, lots and lots of good people I'm consistently working with to get better at poker. Some of these people are now poker coaching coaches, right? We have uh, DraftGanger. He's literally streaming $5,000 buy-in tournaments for the Poker Coaching Premium members. So make sure you are learning from these people too. You can get this at jlpoker.com slash tough. I'll post this uh, link to the Amazon page in the chat. Uh, but anyway, like that, that is what I'm doing to consistently work hard and improve. And at pokercoaching.com, if you all been paying attention, I've been hiring a decent number of coaches recently because I want to learn from them and better my skills. And I get to share it with all of you. So they're going to teach me and I'm going to share it with all of you because uh, why not? We're a community. We might as well work hard to improve our skills. All right. Being afraid to get it all in light, light, lightish with like ace jack against an absolute lunatic is likely a bankroll problem. I agree. A lot of people think that um, you got to get in with the nuts because they're playing for a third of their bankroll. They have a ton of money on the table for them, and that's a problem. The higher the variance you're going to experience, the smaller chunk of the bankroll you should use. Sure, I completely agree. The thing is, is a lot of people make the gigantic blunder of being nowhere near bankrolled properly. And you have to make sure you're properly bankrolled. Check out my bankroll Bible at jlpoker.com slash bankroll. I'll type a link for all of you. There you go. All right. Oh, how do you join the study group? Um, go to pokercoaching.com, click on the community tab, get in the discord, and you should see it there. I have... Vance is saying something about a super user. I don't know anything about random super users. I would definitely recommend you consult the support team for whatever site you're playing on. Do you have any discounts for poker coaching right now? I don't think so. Black Friday is coming soon, though. We always, we always go all out on Black Friday. So uh, if you want to set up for poker coaching and you're willing to wait a while, then wait a while. However, I would say that if you have a month between now and Black Friday... You should probably just sign up and start studying. The great thing about poker coaching compared to most other training sites is that it's relatively cheap and it's very high value. Whenever you provide more value at a cheaper price, turns out like a no-brainer, right? That is the goal is to make it a no-brainer to the point that if you play poker and you want to get better at poker, then it's like the place to go. What's my take on 10-handed cash games? They're boring. <laughs> but I mean, like whatever, you know. Should you buy this book if you have my Beating Small Stakes book? Yes, this, this book, Excelling at Tough No Limit Hold'em Games, is very different than Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em. Mastering Small Stakes No Limit Hold'em is a guide on how to beat poker, okay? This book is a series of chapters by the coaches. You see all of these uh, little lines going down? These are Each one of these is chapters. It's like 20 chapters long, right? All of the coaches made one, two, three... Um, chapters on areas of their expertise. For example, um, John Van Fleet, Ape Styles, has chapters on dealing with continuation bets and continuation betting. Uh, Vlada has a chapter on ICM that I learned a lot from. It was, it was amazing. Uh, Bert Stevens, Draft Ganger, discussed final table strategies with a medium stack, which is like the most difficult spot to play because when you're shallow stack, you don't really care if you go broke because you're probably going to go broke next. And as the big stack, you want to just be kind of bonkers aggressive. But the medium stack is where people have a very, very tough time. Do you prefer a three? Do you, I prefer a three bet only strategy from early position against under the gun and under the gun plus one. Usually not. Um, there are certainly times, but usually not. How's the grind with the kids going? Kids are good. They're growing up. They're growing up fast. Children grow up quickly. Life marches forward. The year's almost over. I thought this was going to be the greatest year ever. Last year, I was like, oh, it's December. We're going to make. 2020, the best year yet. Oh, it has not been the best year yet. <laughs> um, if you purchase the PDF, it should be available. John, if wherever you bought it from, let people know that you uh, bought the book. You should be getting the book. You should have got the book a long time ago. Probably went to your junk folder or you missed it or something. 
Anyway, um, look, my goal is to give you incredibly high level educational poker content at an affordable price. The most expensive thing I offer at pokercoaching.com, if you do not get it on a sale or anything like that, will cost you $3 per day. That is the most you will ever have to pay me for poker coaching to get access to the vast majority of stuff I've ever made. And a lot of my other coaches, right? All the people we just, I mean, I'm just trying to think who we were hired recently. We hired James Romero. He was um, top 10 live player before COVID happened. Um, we hired Brad Wilson, world-class cash game player. He has a great podcast, Chasing Poker Greatness. We just hired him as a new cash game coach because you all said you wanted more cash game content. So we did it, right? We have um, Faraz Jaka. You all know Faraz Jaka, the, the homeless poker player. He has no house, <laughs> but a lot of money. <laughs> oh, man. We have some good inside info about a, a game Faraz played recently. Ooh, it's good. It's good, good, good news. Um, anyway, check out pokercoaching.com. Just go there, check it out. Most we ever charge is three bucks a day. Listen, if you're playing poker for any amount of real money, you should probably be spending some amount of time getting better at poker. Where do you get this? Pokercoaching.com. Go to pokercoaching.com, get the premium package, literally $3 per day. If you're a cash game player, make sure you check out the Cash Game Masterclass. Also, I have a decent amount of me streaming um, myself playing cash games. So make sure you get in on that. We had great sessions playing in relatively tough cash games online. So make sure you check that out if you're a cash game player. Also, loads and loads of quizzes, et cetera, et cetera. We have a private coaching session with Frost tomorrow. Nice. Hope you learn a ton. All right. 2020 set the bar for what a bad year looks like. <laughs> uh, but it's still, uh, still better than 2003 where Jason got divorced <laughs> Got arrested and went bankrupt. Yeah, uh, I guess if you didn't get divorced, arrested, and bankrupt, then um, I guess this year's better. I guess. I guess. Can you be ca good at cash games and tournaments, or should you focus on just one? Look, if you're trying to build a bankroll and trying to get good at poker, I highly recommend you find one game and devote yourself to it. Because if you can find one game that you can beat and you can play it a ton, then... You'll have a place you can go to make money when you need to make money. Like back in the day, I used to be very good at sit and goes. I was great at sit and goes. And I always knew if I needed to, I could go back to sit and goes, grind out some money, which was great. Eventually, though, I transitioned to tournaments because you could play tournaments for higher stakes and you could play them live. And, um, you know, I had some downswings in tournaments when I started, just like most people do. And I could just go back to sit and goes and grind out $10,000 or $20,000 if I needed to whenever I needed to. Just... It doesn't matter sitting down and doing it. Um, also, that's going to make sure your resources in terms of time, effort, energy, bankroll are not spread thin, meaning that you're just like playing the same thing on a regular basis and you're putting in the reps to get good at it. So I definitely recommend that you um, do one thing. Do I also trade? I suppose you mean trading stocks? No. From what I understand, look, I've talked to a bunch of world-class hedge fund managers who have, you know, billions of dollars, and they essentially all tell me, are you going to devote your life to this? Clearly, I'm not going to devote my life to trading right now. Um, do you have insider information? No, I don't. Well, then day trading is not for you. And it turns out day trading is not for pretty much anyone because you're basically flipping coins, as far as I understand, and you don't want to flip coins for a living. You want to flip coins with an edge. And the thing is, is that you may think you know more things. A lot of people think they know things that they do not. And um, you're speculating a lot of the time, right? When you're speculating, sometimes you're going to be right, sometimes you're going to be wrong. If you're right more often than not, I guess it's fine and good. But I have been warned enough by people who I respect, people who view me as a good, smart, world-class poker player, who tell me, load your money in ETFs and forget about it, and you'll be A-OK. -okay. So what do I do? Load my money in ETFs and forget about it. It's way, way, uh, it's, there's no stress. My money's mostly, mostly in wealth front, which, you know, reallocates all your money appropriately and I'm not worried about it. You have to understand what you're good at and what you're not good at. And if you um, have like literally not devoted your life to something and other you're competing against other people who have, it's probably not going to go great for you.
Are you operating under the idea that bad press is better than no press? I have no clue what you're talking about. Um, let's see. You're interested in the bankroll Bible. Um, so we, we've had actually problems with the site. Go to jonathanlittlepoker.com slash bankroll. Let's see if this works. You have to understand, there's a saying on the internet, hate is going to hate. And if people are hating, I would hope you are smart enough to realize that uh, those people are trying to make themselves seem relevant by pulling down someone who they perceive to be better than them. So I would hope that you don't listen to haters. Uh, this link does work, so make sure you check out that link. Hate is going to hate sunglasses emote. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I mean, look, in all seriousness, if you follow people who actively hate on random people who they've never interacted with, they don't even know, understand what those people are spending their time and effort and resources doing. And ask yourself, what's the purpose of this? At the end of the day, people try to do things to either make more money or make more, um, call it clout, right? And it's important to recognize that if people are trying to gain clout by tearing others down, then, I mean, simply put, they're losers, <laughs> right? So why are you spending your time watching, following, hanging out with losers? All right, let's see. Keep your eyes open. Indeed, you got to keep your eyes open. Follow the money, follow the um, clout, what they're trying to accomplish. A really great marketing tactic, well, great, great if you're not good at anything else. A really great marketing tactic if you're not good at much is to find people who are good at something, who have a good following, and then hate on them. Um, some people in the poker space have done this amazingly well. They've like, you know, basically just no-name people, but they hate on people over and over and over and over again. And sometimes those people fight back. And inevitably, if you will find people who also hate other people a lot. And... The tough thing is that while that kind of thing stirs up drama, stirs up excitement perhaps, it's also just people having a weenie, weenie diggling contest and you don't need to be involved with this type of thing. It's useless. So whenever people are hating on you and they're hating on someone else, realize these are people trying to improve their status by trying to tear down someone else's status, very often nonsensically. So... Is that what you want to be spending your time with? I would hope not. My friends with Mike Mattisau and Phil Helmuth. We're friendly. I don't think I've ever been out to dinner with any of them. But no, we're friendly. I have no problems with them as far as I can tell. Mike Mattisau goes off with a ridiculous political rant sometimes. Let's see... Um, CK, look, I, I don't even know what you're asking right here. So resend the email if I did not reply appropriately. All right, I have to get going. Hope you all have a great day. If you spend your time hanging out, well, I'll, I'll tell you all a little secret to life. You are essentially the sum of the five people you hang around with the most. So, hang around with good people. And whenever I say hang around, I don't even mean by like people you actually hang around with physically. I mean, people you listen to, people you talk to, people you learn from, right? You want to make sure that you are hanging out with, learning from smart, enlightened people who are succeeding at life by bettering the world. If you actively hang around people who are trying to tear down others, who are stirring up nonsense, well, your life's going to be a, a lot of drama and nonsense. And if your life is drama and nonsense, it's probably not going to work out so well for you in the end. All right, have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Thanks to all of you for being here. I appreciate it. Oh, see, James Romero popped in in the chat. Hello, James. Hope you're having a great, great day. I just cited you as a re reason, uh, like a, a very, very good poker coaching coach. So thanks for being a coach. I appreciate it. Enjoy yourselves. Make the most of your week. 2020 is almost over. I don't know if there's time to turn 2020 around yet. <laughs> I sure hope there is, but uh, we will see. All right, have a great day. Good luck with everything. And I will talk to you all next time. Bye-bye.